I'm sorry, I'm going to be a bit lazy and use some notes. Um, Madam Chairman, uh, thank you for the invitation and to all of you for coming to this evening for this uh, debate. Um, I must first of all address Gawain's challenge. Uh, it's a bit like Churchill's comment on his birth, uh, this occasion in 1991, the Harrogate Conservative Spring Conference. As Churchill said, I know I was there, but I can't recall the occasion. <laughs> um, I suspect it was your pronunciation of the word irrevocable that uh, did for you, but there it is. Uh, of course, the European Union Treaty is, 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 is re revocable, as you put it, simply by a vote of the House of Commons. It can be stopped, which is why David Cameron is promising a referendum so that the British people can vote, and if they vote to leave, then leave we will. But I'm here because the date that uh, Lisa arranged this debate on is a particularly important one, of course, historically. And it's great to be back here at York University. I, um, I was a, a member of the court for seven, several years, 15 years. And New Berixel, who this building was named after, a rather austere figure, um, but he put the university on the map and rightly is remembered. And uh, I also officially opened the Science Park many years ago, and I'm glad it's being extended with EU money now. As Lisa said, I was first elected as a Conservative, um, but I fell out with David Cameron over his new European alliance, um, a new group in the European Parliament called the European Conservatives and Reformist Group. Nick Clegg described it on one of the TV leaders' debates as a, an alliance of nutters, homophobes, anti-Semites, and climate change deniers. And the Economist said it is a shoddy and shaming alliance, and continues to be so today. I'm very pleased I'm not in it. But I don't need to stress the importance of the anniversary, the 11th of November 1914, saw the guns fall silent on the Western Front. And I felt that the opportunity of speaking to the University of York's Union on the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of that event, uh, was one I could not possibly miss. So that's why I'm here. The title of one of the most famous anti-war books, Invest in Nixon and Noyes, All Quiet on the Western Front, quotes a telegram at the time when the guns had fallen silent. It was a novel published in 1928 about a group of schoolmates who were encouraged to enlist by their teacher. It was one of the first books to be banned and burned by the Nazis. Now, I'm not a pacifist. Uh, indeed, uh, some wars are just. The First World War, basically was a result of German militarism and rearmament, and of course it was justified within the war by the Germans' treatment of the people they occupied. Indeed, my uh, best-known relation is T. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, who uh, in the First World War led the Arabs to revolt in the First Arab Spring against the Turks. And uh, another relation of mine was the first officer VC at the Battle of the Alma, during the Crimean War in 1854. And we've seen this year alone that Russia's instincts have changed little. And I'm pleased that this week Angela Merkel has decided to take on Putin. Because this week sees another anniversary. 25 years ago, the Berlin Wall fell, and along the Iron Curtain, people rose to freedom. As it happened, I worked for an intelligence chief before my election in 1984. And after my election, I spent a lot of time meeting dissidents behind the Iron Curtain, reformists, people who were desperate for change. They all said, we want to come back to Europe. And they did, almost without bloodshed, <coughs> attracted by the other side of the wall, the prosperous, and as they saw it, fair EU. I then, after my election, and after 1990 when the Berlin Wall fell, set up the European Union's Democracy and Human Rights Initiative to assist the transformation of the former Soviet bloc. This is a program that still runs today. It's worth about 150 million euros. And it's the only EU program that can still operate without host country consent. So in other words, countries like Cuba or China can get money for their reformists and dissidents. So this is part of the context in which I oppose the motion that this House believes that Britain is better off out of the EU. Because where does our great country stand today? Well, we now account for less than 1% of the world's population and less, 3 less than 3% of global income. As each year goes by, these numbers shrink a little. We'll find it increasingly hard to get our voice heard on topics that affect our prosperity and well-being if we go it alone. 
Of course there are problems. Just to list a few. I'll do it for you, Gary. The EU's common fisheries policy has disrupted the world's richest fishery, our North Sea. The common agricultural policy is a tyrannous waste of money that keeps food prices, food prices higher, a last bastion of protectionism. The European Parliament seems like a travelling circus trekking between Strasbourg and Brussels. As Gawain knows, my single seat campaign, which I began in 2010, is now supported by 78% of MEPs who want to stay in Brussels and save the taxpayer £150 million a year. And it's true that some EU regulations are heavy-handed. But there's also a lot of good within the European Union. First and foremost is the single market of 500 million consumers. Free trade, as Gawain said, is one of the most powerful ways of boosting wealth. We'd be foolish to compromise our access to that market. Contrary to popular belief, EU membership doesn't cost us that much either. Our annual net budget contribution is 8.3 billion. That's about a half a percent of our GDP. And when the CBI surveyed its members last year, it found that 8 out of 10 wanted to stay within the European Union. At the moment, we, as the European Union, negotiate with America, China, or Japan, we're doing so as part of the world's largest trade bloc, which accounts for nearly 20% of GDP. If we were on our own, the balance of power would be quite different. The US economy is seven times as big as ours, the Chinese is five times as big, and Japan's twice our size. And finally, the single market, based on what are known as the four freedoms, that is goods, services, and capital, moving freely across the frontiers of the 28 European Union countries, is one of the most important charters for freedom the world has ever seen. The Treaty of Rome in 1958 is a great step forward. We leave it at our peril. Thank you.